Hey everybody, I am excited today because I have the author of this book, Mason King, on the line. And Mason, if you don't know him, he is an author, he's a pastor, and he is currently studying for his PhD in church history, which is really, really fun. But he wrote this book called A Short Guide to Spiritual Disciplines that I just read through in the last couple of days, and I found to be really, really helpful. And we're going to explore some of the things in here as well as... Uh, I just kind of want to pick his brain and see how he's doing this, uh, how he's applying this to his life, because I love hearing how other people are uh, essentially applying their spiritual disciplines or habits to their life to move them forward in their walk with God. And Mason has a lot of wisdom on that. So I'm excited to chat. So Mason, thank you for coming and joining me today, brother. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, this is just something I think is so needed right now in our era of... Uh, just constant distraction that so many of us have between social media and everything else that's going on in our lives. And so um, thank you for writing it. And I want to kind of like just pick through and pull out some different nuggets out of here and share some of this. But but anyway, uh, I want to start by saying thank you also for this book opens with so much grace. And, and I think when I hear about a book on spiritual disciplines, uh, like I, that's not the first thing that comes to mind. You know, that, I think that's probably yeah. why you added that. Is that correct? Yeah. It is. It is. I think it should be an invitation. Many t many times people hear about spiritual disciplines and they think, oh, I'm going to be told what I have to go do. And yeah. the, whole, the whole thing is that we've been saved to a kind of life with Jesus. And yeah. he wants good for us. So we got to yeah. see him rightly to understand what he wants us to do. Yeah. And I just really appreciated that because, uh, yeah, you take... I don't know, maybe like even 20% of the book to, yep. to, to highlight that facet of it before we actually get to talking about any of the specific things to do, because, because yeah, it's easy to get into a works mindset or a pharisaical approach, you know, mm -hmm. and obviously that's what we're trying to avoid. And so anyway, I thought that was a really great way to kind of lead into this book. I want to highlight something here too, because once you get out of that, the thing that you touch on first, I think this is so significant and so important. And I'm going to just read a little passage out of here. And so this is from this chapter that you call dethroning the digital savior, mm -hmm. which I think is just so powerful. And I'm going to read a little section here. So you say, just as an addict runs to the substances of nicotine, sugar, or alcohol to numb the sting of stress or pain, and then eventually just runs to the substance whenever, because the habit has become so entrenched in his daily rhythms, we all, each one of us, seek pleasure on demand from tiny screens and heart buttons. If we're honest, we not only do this in hard moments from which we want to escape, but in any moment, even the fun ones, even the meaningful ones, our tension is that disoriented. Yeah. I thought this was so good in such a powerful way to kind of make this point that I think a lot of us forget. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Do you want to add anything to that? Anything you want to expand on to that that our listeners need to hear? Yeah, I, I am not against technology, but I am against being monetized as a person. And so <laughs> what, is, what has been helpful for me in thinking through this of how I use my time and how I Really, I, I say in there also, and I say all the time, that your attention is the most precious commodity that you have. And if you're yeah. wondering, well, no, it's just me. You think about the billions of dollars spent to get your attention and yeah. keep it. And so yeah. really, I've had to come to a point of being offended by the amount of effort put in to taking away my decisive actions. And so mm -hmm. like I can, I can stop and go, I want to check Instagram and make, make the decision to do that. But if I'm checking it for the fifth time that hour, I'm not in control of that decision. It's just a dopamine yeah. loop in my head. That for me is just how I'm trying to paint it for myself and then for my kids of thinking through like, hey, mm -hmm. if it's free, you're the product. It's yep. it's not a service. So, Yeah, there have been a handful of these documentaries that I've seen. You've probably seen some of them where when you, you see the curtain pulled back of what's yep. going on with the algorithm, with the thousands of people at Facebook or whatever who are all designing this thing, you know, and so the odds are stacked against us, you know? Yes. Okay. So I want to, I'd love to hear from you, your journey with technology and mm -hmm. how you have kind of grown in this, you know, any personal struggles that have maybe led you to this point. Uh, Cause a lot of us, you know, we go through things, challenges to get to the point where we make the change. Uh, so how that's played and then how really that just ultimately led to 
you know, you're writing a book out of this because, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Um, you know, Romans 12 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that this is your mm-hmm. spiritual act of worship. And I, I teach weekly in the church, trying to help people understand the story of the Bible, how it applies to their life. As I'm thinking through studying it for myself, uh, enjoying the tools and the toys that, that we get, I'm looking yeah. at my own mind going, I can't focus as well as I used to. I find myself coveting more things. I'm willing to spend money on more things. Um, mm-hmm. I like to think I have self-control. And then I look like I'm in a conversation with my wife and I pick up my phone. All of a sudden the conversation stops and I realize I look up from my phone and think, oh, this is a fight. Like I, I just started this because I let myself get distracted. Yeah. And I think I've had, I've had to think through everything that technology promises me and if it really is helpful in the long run. And that's why, I mean, mm-hmm. that passage you read, like for me, I really have to say, like, what am I trusting it to deliver me from? And am I going to choose the harder thing to try and become a denser person, if I could use that yeah. phrase? I have felt really distracted, like I've been missing moments with my kids. Mm. And because I can't turn off the pressure to work or my desire. So one more email, one more check of something. And in the end, it just is... I've gotten really disappointed at how much it's paid off and what I feel like I've missed. And so yeah. I've just tried to battle against it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's been the same for me too. I have gone through seasons of, I took an entire year off of social media in which um, we actually did a podcast not too long ago talking about that, just exploring what I learned from that and, um, and what that experience was like. But yeah, it's just such a, uh, a unique challenge. I mean, even a cell phone as a whole, as a device yep. that has mm-hmm. provides so much use and value that it's hard for me to imagine living without it. And so even looking at some of the uh, dumb phones and the light phone and some of these, mm-hmm. it's like, I, I don't know if I can get rid of GPS. I That's don't right. know if I can get rid of yeah. whatever, not having music on my phone or whatever those things are. So it's like those conveniences have sucked me in so strongly mm-hmm. uh, that it, it bothers me, you know? It just really do, yeah. does bother me. Um, I mean, I think about uh, how we access our money, how you access maps. Mm-hmm. And no one wants to be the blue bubble. Like, you don't want to break up the iMessage chain. And so, like, yeah. you think through all these things of, like, man, it just is an inconvenience. And I would tell mm-hmm. you that makes a really good product when it becomes indispensable. Yeah. But it's... Uh, it's the willingness on my end to like be entertained instead of utilizing it as a tool. Yeah. And I feel like my, my, uh, my self-discipline gets softened when it becomes more and more entertainment for me. Yeah. What are uh, ages of your kids? 10, eight and six. Okay. All right. So you probably haven't dealt much with, so we have a nine, nine year old is our oldest and okay. the conversation of, I'd like a phone, Dad. I'm like, you're uh-huh. not even close, buddy. You know, oh, yeah. it but, started. It started. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not. It's not difficult yet. Like, yeah. you know, we still have a few more years before. I think there's a lot of uh, the pressure, the external peer pressure, or mm-hmm. all of his friends have them, and I feel yeah. bad that you're the only one who doesn't. But I actually feel really good, you know. And yeah. um, I'm not looking forward to dealing with that. But but it's funny. I was just reading the other day about Steve Jobs like never let his kids play with an iPad. <laughs> yeah. And he, he knew that like before the curve, before all yeah. the data was out and like, you know, at the very, very beginning. And, uh, and I was just reading, I think Bill Gates as well, like, you know, still like is massively restrictive on screen time or was with his kids and whatever. Yeah. And so we see these people who are the insiders who are mm-hmm. doing this and it's like, there's some lessons to learn here, you know? There's, I mean, I, I think about that and I have the conversation, my oldest daughter is 10. And so we have the conversation of, Hey, like, I know you want all these things, what you want is connection, but the back edge of all of this, like your brain isn't going to be formed fully for another 14, 15 years. Yeah. And so the, the impact over the next crucial eight to nine years, like I'm not willing to sacrifice that. And so we're trying to, yeah. we're trying to think through that. Like I've done, I mean, my wife and I have done a bunch of studies and read a bunch of things, or we've read a bunch of studies about this age and the impacts of social media yeah. and technology and trying to think through, man, how do we guard our kids and at least give them a fighting chance? Cause like you said earlier, it's not a fair mousetrap like that. Yeah. They don't, they don't have the muscle memory 
and the understanding to not be overtaken by it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of the phone side of things, but I'd love yep. for you to talk uh, specifically because I've emailed with you a couple different times here and I keep uh -huh. getting these auto replies that say, <laughs> yeah. I'm only checking email or I won't check email till Tuesday. So blah, 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 blah. So tell yeah. me about your email schedule, what you're doing there. Is this modeled after Tim Ferriss for a work week thing or something? Oh, different? I, I mean, I, there are seasons where it is, but also we've been emailing over the summer and I've been traveling a ton. And so mm -hmm. it is more of like, Hey, I'm not going to touch email right now. If I'm at camp or somewhere, I'm, I'm very blessed to be able to have an assistant that will check things. And if it is crucial, she'll text me and let me know. But I even like, I mean, I came back in the office today and I think my out of office says tomorrow. And I really just tried to give myself the freedom to be human and how I respond to people. And yep. to say like, Hey, I, I, when I get in the office, I need a day to catch up on things. I need a day to kind of take my, like catch my breath and even sort through everything that's come in before I just yeah. start firing things back off. Um, I, I have read a bunch of like Cal Newport and Tim Ferriss and everything's on email. And, you know, everyone says that e email just begets more email. Like it has this multiplicative effect. Yeah. And so I've actually just stopped responding to a lot of things if I can, like if I'm one of six yeah. recipients, I just find the person or I walk by their office and I don't respond to the email and I've tried to be a little more ruthless with it uh, or yeah. just delegating the email the best I can with my team. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. I've, I've also gone through different seasons of uh, yeah, just having stricter walls in place. And I did have a season of literally checking it only once per week in yeah. which was really advantageous. And, and it is, it's so I mean, everything Tim said in his book, you know, which I read 15 years ago now, it's so true that it's very, very rare when there's something really important that can't be fixed that happens. Right. Right. Uh, and, and I, I don't know. It, but at the same time, it's also such a slippery slope. And so the way that I typically find my way out of that when I do have a strong rhythm of doing weekly is so many things are in my inbox. And so I'm writing an article. It's like, well, I got to go back to this email to see it. And then I see other emails and it's like, oh. I guess I should reply. You know, it's like this slippery slope, just like going in Instagram. It's like, I'm right. going in here just to check this DM. And then 10 minutes later, you're like, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so, so it is challenging. But uh, anyway, so that rhythm, when you're at your best, when you have that rhythm going that you're happy with, yeah. uh, is that what it looks like? Is actually processing one time a week or how often? No, I, I try at my best. I'm not checking email until later in the morning. And so it mm -hmm. might be 10 or 11 a.m. And then I'll try and check it around four before I go home. And yeah. I, I have a program. Are you familiar with the program Freedom? It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's kind of like a content blocker or a filter for your Mac or your iPhone. I've used it for four or five years. And yeah. I, I really enjoy it. It's only gotten better. So over, it I, uh, say it again. Oh, sorry. Keep telling, talking yeah. more. Tell me everything no. about it. No, you're good. You're good. Um, <laughs> It's only gotten better for the last four or five years that it is built to put in blocks of time to block, you know, content categories, websites, or apps across ah. all of your devices. And so you can sync it. And I mean, it really is, it's intrusive in the way that you want it to be. And you can even lock yourself out of it. So like I've had it set up where it's when I, when I walk in the door to my house around the same time each day at like 430 to five everything that I want to go to for entertainment is shut off until after my kids are in bed. So That's 4 35 awesome. to 9 PM every night, I can't access email on my phone. I can't access Instagram. Like it's, it saves like for me, it's just, it's not available and I've got to go pull out my laptop if I want to get to it. And if I do that, yeah. it's going to be pretty awkward, but yeah. you know, everyone can kind of like peek at it from their pocket and it's just, no, I'm going to take out my phone, put it on the counter and I know I can't use it for a while. And that's super helpful. So that is so good. I'm so glad you shared that. Really useful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be downloading that because yeah, I, I've, I've used a couple of apps like that, that haven't performed well enough yeah. for me. And, uh, anyway, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, they've okay. got all kinds of stuff. They've got plugins, and different things. They've, they've done a good job thinking through it. They also have a podcast where they will address some of the tensions and topics around yeah. how to manage your attention. So it's helpful. Yeah. That's really good. Okay. And it's just called freedom, right? For Mac yeah. or Apple. Right. Okay. 
Okay, so with that in mind, let's talk about how you're handling social media and what your process is with this. Because again, same way, like I, I'm trying different things. Some things have worked in certain seasons and not. And so I'm just curious right. what you're doing a now and in your best season, what has worked best for you? Yeah, uh, right now I am, uh, when the book came out, it was a lot of Instagram. It was a lot of connecting with people, I was doing podcasts. Yeah. And so I felt like I was on it more than I ever wanted to be, which was ironic to me. And uh, <laughs> it just was, but yeah. I am blocking it to about an hour and a half in the afternoon and then maybe mm -hmm. 30 minutes at night. So I'm using that app. I'm setting up like, hey, it's not available. And what's key for me is that it's not available first thing in the morning. Yeah. And so I'm really like, uh, have you ever, have you read Justin Early's book, The Common Rule? No, I haven't. If, it's a great book. Justin, he okay. he has some disciplines that he puts out. And one of them is just scripture before phone. And yeah. so, you know, a key thing for me is my phone is not my alarm clock. My phone is not available to me first thing in the morning. And so I can go to the word. I use an audio Bible while I'm making kids lunches or something. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not able to just dive in to a dopamine yeah. circuit that I'm going to be a slave to. And for all the studies you do or the Huberman podcast you listen to and you think about like how your neurons are firing throughout the day, your attention refreshes every day and you get to choose how it's stewarded. And so you kind of build mm -hmm. that discipline in in the morning and it helps you. And then I try and delay checking in on things for a few hours so I can get some good work done and focus. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of good there. So one of the things you, you mentioned was stewarding and that's yeah. something that you mentioned in this book. That I'm like, that's such a good... I talk about this all the time with money, but mm -hmm. I haven't thought of it much through the lens of attention. And I'm like, why have I not thought of that? You know, but this is a perfect thing for us to steward and we have the opportunity yeah. to steward and there's so much at stake if we don't steward it well. That's right. So, so I love that. I love that, that you, you have that frame on it and that we're thinking of it through that, that lens. Uh, and the other thing I was just thinking about with that, that little, which you mentioned uh, Bible before phone or whatever, mm -hmm. just that little framework. Like I do that with food all the time. Like one of the things I, I do with dessert is I always force myself to eat fruit before I have something sugary. Uh, and yeah. it's the same thing. It's like, all right, if I'm going to have the thing that's not as good, I'm going to get the good thing in first. Sure. And in any way, and it's like, that's a rule that I have tried to apply it at a certain point in my life, certain points where it's like, I'm pretty consistent about it. I'm not touching social media until I get word in. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I love that. Thanks for sharing that. That's good. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that's email, social media. Mm -hmm. I'd like to talk about, in the book you mentioned this a little bit, um, where you were talking about your Bible reading and how you mentioned something that's something that I've struggled with, where you were talking about how a lot of people will kind of get their yearly check off the box every day thing. And yes, of course, that's beneficial. But there's also something about I think you call it like face to face time where it's just yeah, getting yeah. into the word for the joy of being with God rather than checking a box. And so I'm curious what that looks like for you now or in your best season, uh, how you balance those two things, like what that ratio looks like or whatever. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so in the book, I use the phrase uh, side by side or face to face. And I think about mm -hmm. uh, just to give context. So my wife and I live much of life side by side. It's covering X's and O's with kids and who's got the schedules. But we have to sit down and look face to face to enjoy each other and to spend time yeah. with each other. And so I, applying that to scripture, uh, if your time in the word is I've got to get X amount read for the day and I'm going to judge the productivity of my time based on how much I read and the nuggets I get out of it, which I mean – Evangelicals are really good at treating the Bible like a treasure hunt so that we get the facts that we want. So it's applicable to life. And like these, this is what we need. Like it's a science experiment yeah, yeah. or an equation. And I mean, the Bible is to teach us how to live in God's world and God's way. That's what it yeah. is. It shows us his identity and ours. And so yeah. like walking through it slowly, one of the, one of my favorite things, there's a woman named Jan Johnson who walks through, uh, Lectio Divina, which I outline in the book. And it's an old practice of like how to sit and use your imagination of what the text is telling you. And so for me, narratives work really well with this. So I'll pick a narrative mm -hmm. from the Gospels and just try and sit and use my imagination like a Netflix show and yeah. try and go, okay, what was happening? Am I reading the right tone? 
what, what would I miss in here? And just asking the spirit to help me and yeah. to really look at it. And so there's a couple times a week I'm trying to do that. I, uh, I actually, I read a lot of poetry and try to read Christian poetry. And so for me, pairing the two together of like slower reading of the text and then maybe a poem that goes along the same theme is really helpful to mm -hmm. me and just to engage different parts of my mind. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, I think we should be reading through and making our home in the world of the Bible so that we know God's character better. And it just becomes part of us. Yeah. But also we need to sit and really think through different parts of it. Like if you were to take, you know, the upper room discourse in John, like take John 15 or John 17 and just sit with it. You take John 17 and just see what the Lord is praying for and who he's praying for instead yeah. of just trying to rush through it. Yeah. So as far as Christian poetry, so I have dabbled in a little bit, but I've always been interested in reading more. Uh, yeah. Who uh, who should I start with? Uh, I'll tell you, actually, I picked up my favorite book on the way out of the house this morning. It's on my desk right now. And it's a guy named George Herbert, and he's a 17th George century Herbert. Welsh priest. Mm -hmm. And it is some of the most rich Christian poetry I think I've read uh, ever. Really? And then Malcolm Geit is a British poet right now. Um, I might be mispronouncing his last name. It's G-U-I-T-E. And then there's a few anthologies that have come out the last couple of years. I'm looking at my bookshelf. Um, yeah, there's a few anthologies that if you were to search on Amazon, like okay. that have been really helpful. They'll give a poem from a different author, explain it because poetry is confusing. It makes you slow down. Sometimes the context is yeah. helpful. So yeah. I think one is called The Paraphrase of the Soul. That's one of my favorites. Okay. Great. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then let's take a look at prayer time. Uh, what are you doing? And again, like, again, because I know there's ups and flows, there's high yeah. times and low times with this, but at your best, what is your prayer life look like? How have you, um, yeah, applied just a lot of what you're talking about in the book to your prayer life? Yeah. I find that I am most consistent in my prayer life when I journal. And so I will sit and write out my prayers. Uh, I will also take Psalms and pray through a Psalm. So I mm -hmm. talk about this as an example in the book, but uh, instead of, you know, playing the roulette where you flip open the Bible and you're looking for something, I just try and make my way through the Psalms and yeah. I read five, but I choose one that I want to pray through yeah. and I'll pray it back to God. And yeah. so I will, I try and journal as much as possible. It's probably right now about three or four times a week uh, that I'll sit down and, and do that. And then uh, probably every other day I'm praying through a Psalm. And then every day uh, I, you know, shotgun prayers kind of, of like throughout the day, I'm just praying from meeting to meeting, praying for what's going on in our home, um, trying to be, trying to have almost like breath prayers, as you would say, between the parts of the day. I give a rhythm in the book of like, in between the, the segments of the day, I try and take breaks. And that's a consistent thing for me to return to prayer in between each window. Yeah, that was, a, I, I highlighted that, this praying the hours idea, because I actually yeah. had never heard of that. I'm like, that's really interesting. So super helpful. will you expand on that just a little bit more? Yeah. Hasn't uh, heard of it? Sure. One of my good friends, uh, one of my mentors helped me understand it and really put it into practice. But the issue is that, or the, the thing, the structure, uh, when you wake up right before lunch, right before you go home in the afternoon, or before you go to bed, just spend five or 10 minutes in prayer. And you're thinking through the emotions that you've experienced, which emotions are your body's way of kind of telling you what's going on outside of you. So your, your mm -hmm. feelings, your thoughts, if you've committed sin um, of omission or commission, and then bringing those before the Lord. And the example that I use that's often helpful for me is, I, I don't know if you have this experience, I will get emails. Uh, and since I'm not sitting in front of the person, I read the email and I read it with the worst possible tone. Or I get a, I get a text <laughs> message and someone puts a period in my text message and I'm like, why are you mad? Like you said, fine with a period. You could have just said, okay, and it would be fine. <laughs> and uh, I'll get hot about it because I get in my head and, and I start having yeah. a conversation with them in my head. <laughs> And I don't handle that. I don't move through that emotion. I just go home and then somebody in my house says something and my reaction is just a teensy bit bigger than it should be to whatever yeah. the offense was. And for me, it's, yeah, that wasn't about anything my wife or one of my kids said or what the dog did. That's me 
carrying anxiety around that I haven't set before the Lord. And so yeah. I try and at, at those hinges in my day, really try and check in, process through emotions with the Holy Spirit, and then set things down and then turn and look at what's next uh, and ask yeah. for grace for what's ahead of me. Yeah, that's good. So it's funny you, you say that. I was literally texting with Linda today and she, or I asked her something and she replied back, sure. And I, and it was something that I, I think she's excited to do. And so I replied back. I mean, I'll just read my reply because it was, uh, I said, can you give me a more solid yes if you really want to do this? I can't tell what quote sure means over text. <laughs> that's great. So, so anyway, yes, it's like, that's, that's what happens. And it's so easy to read the, the worst and you know, yeah. go to that worst assumption. And then it just, you know, can derail your day. Uh, so, well, and anyway. if you're abiding in Christ and you're wanting to like image God to other people, you're responsible for how you act. And so yeah. kind of thinking through, like, I'm a human, I've got emotions, I've got to process those with the Lord and I can't get stuck in them because then I will impact other mm -hmm. people. And so that's a yeah. lot of my time and prayers in those hinges of the day, just trying to process how I'm existing in the day with the Lord. Yeah, that's good. All right. So you mentioned something that I think is a great, great takeaway uh, that I'm going to apply that freedom app um, to being yeah. more present with my family. But I'm, I'm curious, are there other things that you've done that have um, just been notable in your life that if you asked your kids or your wife, um, you know, what has helped make Mason more present? Uh, are there other things like that that have moved the needle for you? Yeah, I, uh, you know, the last part of the book is about limits. And so I talk about attention, emotions and limits. I have really tried to come to terms with that life will never be as long as I think. And so mm. for me, I don't want to miss it. So yeah. I don't like, I'm trying to think through, yes, I love to work. I love to work hard. There will always be excuses for me to find work to do. I need to know when it's okay to walk away from it. And so yeah. in the last three or four years, uh, I just stopped working at night. And I know like most people will be like, oh, that's fine. Like you shouldn't work at night. Yeah, but I thought, oh, I have time. I shall just work until I'm exhausted because it's the one thing that I knew. And so for me, it really is, uh, it has become the habit of bringing less home and thinking, mm -hmm. yeah, work stays at work so I can be present with my family. And then thinking yeah. through my commitments and trying to show up by not being distracted. I, I, mm -hmm. I just don't want to get 10 more years down the line and my kids tell me, yeah, but you were distracted. Uh, like that is a fear of mine. And so I'm trying to claim yeah. my, like reclaim my attention and my presence. So I'm trying to actively yeah. listen like, in conversation with people. Like I'll just try and be more present. Yeah. So is that tied to, cause I remember you mentioned the thing about, um, that old Latin phrase or whatever. About, oh yeah. Memento mori. Don't forget you're going to die or whatever. That's right. Is that yeah. what it was? Yep. Uh, remember you'll die. So is that all part of the same thing of just like keeping death in mind in order to live a good life? Yeah, it, which sounds morbid. I mean, if I pull this up for you on my desk, I have this fake little skull and it is like, it's one of the few things I have on my desk, but it's a reminder. And it's, it's that way because we, we just presume that tomorrow is going to happen. And yeah. I've had like my parent, both of my parents are cancer survivors. My dad had a huge health scare last year. Uh, I have had health issues. I've, I work at a church where a week doesn't go by that I don't get 10 texts about someone facing a serious situation. Yeah. And it's the reminder that death is not the final, like it's not the final word, but yeah. we will, we will lose things and our hope in Christ is a resurrection hope. And so it yeah. just, it's a reminder for me to keep things in perspective. If I get upset about something or if I'm worried about something, um, there's things to enjoy if I remember that I won't always have time. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, I get really stirred up. The thing I'm always trying to remember is just that I am an eternal being That's and right. we have this sliver of time that we are going to be on earth in the grand scheme or scope of eternity, you know, and we have this tiny little amount of time that is our opportunity to do things that we will not be able to do on the other side of death, you know? And it gets me 
I don't know. It, it, yeah, the same way, like what you're talking about, it just helps me to evaluate every decision throughout the day through a different lens. And I think a more important one, more significant one. And, you know, another tangent of this is I remember hearing someone talk about Warren Buffett and whatever it is, the early 90s or something. And uh, health is kind of declining a little bit, obviously, whatever, third richest person in the world. But there's nothing. Uh, if I went to him and said, hey, would you rather have all the money you have or be my age, 42 right now? Like, there's no doubt in my mind that he would say, I would love to be 42, you know, and especially yeah. with him not being a believer. <laughs> like, and sure. I don't know what he thinks, but, but the point is, like, when you think about it through that lens, like, it just, it changes your perspective. It's like, because yeah. cause everybody's, like, chasing more and more money. And it's like, I want more money. I want to build a bigger retirement, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not, I'm not opposed to saving for retirement, you know, but, but the point is, when you understand how valuable your time is, and how much more valuable it is than money. Uh, it just changes how you think about things, you know? Yeah. And you, I mean, entertainment is fun, but if life is just entertainment and distraction, that's not much life. And I, mm. I think we're all, we are tempted yeah. to think that is life. Buy more, play more, be distracted more. But that's not the yeah. depth of relationship that I want to have. Yeah. And Jesus, yeah. I just don't believe Jesus put us on this earth just to spend our entire time seeking our own comfort. Oh, yeah, you know? for sure. Like, there's bigger, more important things for us to do. And I think it's easy, particularly in the Western world, I think you might have addressed this in here too, it's easy for us to get so focused on that is the goal of life. Just yeah. how can we make everything as comfortable as possible, mm -hmm. remove as many problems as possible. Uh, and, and I understand when everyone around you is with that mindset, living that way, it's easy to kind of fall into that trap. But that's not why we're here, you know? Nope. Not so. at all. Anyway. And you're going right. to encounter hard things. And so it's if we think it's all easy and then the hard things happen to us, we're not going to see it with the right perspective. Yeah, for sure. So anyway, uh, all right. So I won't take up any more of your time, but I appreciate the conversation. Uh, everybody go out and check out the book, uh, A Short Guide to Spiritual Disciplines, How to Become a Healthy Christian by Mason King. Um, again, short, easy read, but it'll leave you with, um, yeah, that was another thing. I appreciated your, your insight in the way you communicate some of these thoughts that were different than I had heard other people say before, which is always helpful seeing things through a different kind of vantage point. So thanks again for writing the book. Everybody go check it out. Uh, Mason, where can people find you if they want to reach you online? Yeah. Uh, masonking.org or just Mason King on any of the of the socials. Also have a newsletter on Substack starting in this next month. Oh, so they can find cool. that through awesome. my Instagram. Yeah. Awesome. All right, brother. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to come chat and sharing your wisdom. Uh, I'm excited. I'm going to be applying a lot of this. So thank you for me selfishly and for everyone else <laughs> listening. Um, I think it's going to bless a lot of people. So thanks again, oh. brother. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for reading. All right. We want to know if you've heard about our flagship class called True Financial Freedom. Yeah. And if you haven't, it's more than just a money class. Mm -hmm. It's really about fulfilling your God-given purpose, breaking free from hidden money beliefs and making a lasting impact. Yeah. And we've gotten feedback from students and they've said things like, it is the first class I've taken where at the end of each session, I felt equipped and not burdened. Yeah. And it's less theory and more realistic action steps and guidance. We've also heard it felt like a conversation with friends, which is awesome. Yeah, and it encouraged me in ways I didn't think I would ever experience. This class is on demand, and it's designed for churches and small groups as well as individuals. And you can get all the details at seedtime.com slash TFF.